Obviously, a lot could change given it's so damn early, but the Utah Jazz have gotten off to a start which has literally shocked everyone across the basketball universe. The Jazz were projected to be the 12th seed in my Western Conference standings predictions before the season, and I think most people, if not everyone, expected Utah to struggle after trading Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert to Cleveland and Minnesota. In return for their two former franchise players, we all took into account how the Jazz received eight guaranteed future first round picks. What many of us failed to realize at the time of those trades was that the players, not just future picks which Utah also got in return for Gobert and Mitchell, could flourish with a change of scenery. Jazz president and former Celtics president Danny Ainge put Utah's roster in obvious rebuild mode, but Lori Markkinen and this scrappy young underdog roster said, the 22-23 Utah Jazz are dumbfounding. This video shows you exactly why. We're going to break down Markkinen's domination and every reason for Utah's hot start. But before that, just 8.2% of you watching are subscribed, so please hit the sub box and turn on notifications so you're updated on NBA analysis like this. Please hit the like button to help this video spread. Also, please follow at dflowhoops on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you so much for your support. Back to the content. Before his arrival in Salt Lake, the role of number one option wasn't something Laurie Markkinen had the opportunity of being when he played for Chicago and Cleveland. Markkinen was a productive player for the Cavaliers last season, but realistically, in either Chicago or Cleveland, he was never going to live up to his potential. As an incredibly mobile three-point shooting seven-footer who can draw gravity and even create opportunities off the dribble, Laurie's player archetype blends ideally in the Stephen Curry-altered, space-and-pace modern NBA. Because of how much floor spacing means nowadays, stretch big men have become the hottest commodity there is. Only thing about Laurie is that he's a high volume player, which means he thrives when he can get as many shots up as possible to assert his will on the flow of the game. Chicago and Cleveland just had bigger priorities in terms of their go-to options, and rightfully so. I mean, the Bulls, specifically the Cavaliers, are two tough teams to beat. But the bottom line is, Utah is just all around the better fit for Laurie. On a true shooting clip of 63%, the finishers become Utah's go-to weapon, averaging a team-high 21.9 points per night. He's shooting a career-high by far, 52.9% from the field, and I know it's only been 12 games, but that production is far from a fluke. In fact, Laurie's numbers may even further elevate considering he's making a career low, 29.7% of his shots from three-point range. Markkinen's averaging the same 6.2 triples attempted per game than he averaged last year in Cleveland. However, he shot 6 percentage points better from deep range last year over 61 games compared to what he's currently making from beyond the arc. For his career, Laurie's made 36.1% from distance, which is why you should expect his stats to only increase. Film breakdown on how Laurie's beasting is something I'm saving for a future upload, but let's delve into the other main reasons for why Utah's number one in the Western Conference as of this recording, with a no less than shocking record of nine wins and three losses. Whenever the name Jordan Clarkson is mentioned, you automatically think of the word underrated. He gets flack for his lack of defense, given his skinny frame can get him backed down by stronger defenders down low. Other than that issue, which to be fair can occasionally stand out as a liability, there's little to no weaknesses in the speedy Filipino's bag. Clarkson's seemly aggressiveness, mixed with his timely playmaking awareness, make him one of the most reliable individual creators you can count on to get a bucket at the end of a shot clock. Jordan is an extremely polished ball handler, and he has a ton of poise off the bounce, qualities which hold up even when he's operating against heavy defensive traffic. Clarkson has a pristine ability to get to his spot with that tight handle and has the ability to fluidly transition from the dribble to jump shot elusively yet effectively before defenses have the chance to properly contest. Leaving him slightly open may even be the more effective strategy than clamping him for defenders considering Jordan's making 28.6% of his threes when given 4 to 6 feet of space and 46.7% with just 2 to 4 feet. He's also making 66.7% of his threes with defense defenders 0 to 2 feet away from him. However, don't leave Clarkson too wide open as he does make 54.1% of his deep range bombs with 6 plus feet of space. Speaking of jazz players who've been with the team for more than 12 games, before getting to the newbies, you can't forget about the crafty, wily veterans who've got a ton left in the tank in Mike Conley and Rudy Gay. Conley and Gay were teammates as young up-and-comers back in the Gasol, Randolph, Memphis, Grizzly, Grit and Grind era, so their journeys come full circle in Salt Lake City. 
Shout out to Rudy for providing wing depth and hefty experience, which even includes being a number one scoring option for the Grizzlies and my hometown team in the Raptors. But most specifically, it's been Mike Conley who's provided Utah with both a real spark for this team to start games and overall an organized offensive approach. Conley's second among Jazz rotation players with at least 30 minutes played per game in player efficiency rating, only ranking behind Laurie Markinen. Replacing Clarkson in the backup role, having the starting caliber Colin Sexton come off your bench is a massive luxury. Like Lori, the young bull in Colin was a top 8 pick who was flat out given up on by the organization that drafted him as the Cavaliers refused to extend Sexton for the entire 2022 offseason and eventually used him in a sign and trade to acquire one of the best stars in the game today, Donovan Mitchell. Sexton may not be a star quite yet, but I think there's certainly a universe where he's an all-star in the future, if he can avoid injury of course. The good thing is, there's no pressure in the slightest bit for Colin to be that type of player in Utah. All he needs to be is the microwave for this team off the pine. Operating in the role as sixth man has worked perfectly so far for Colin, especially in November, where his numbers are off the charts. This month so far has seen Sexton average 18.8 points on 61.2% true shooting. He's hitting 38% from downtown, attempting four and a half triples per game. When Sexton finds his flow, bench backcourt players simply can't keep up with the 23-year-old's ability to mix up his attacks. Despite being let go by Cleveland, the offensive electricity of Colin Sexton gives him a chance to take this sixth man role given to him by coach Will Hardy and use it to develop into one of the better combo guards on the planet. There's still a long way to go for Colin, but whatever he's doing early in this month, he needs to keep it up. Most fans were aware that Utah's trades for Markkanen and Sexton at least could have some impact for the Jazz before the season, but no one thought that the trades for Taylor Horton Tucker, Malik Beasley, and Kelly Olynyk would be just as important. After Utah received Pat Bev in the Gobert trade, they traded Beverly straight up in exchange for THT. In one game, Horton Tucker just single-handedly proved to the bottom-feeding Los Angeles Lakers that they shouldn't have gave up on him. Against his former team, Horton Tucker dropped a personal season-high 15 points and shot 6 for 11 from the field off the bench. Horton Tucker's length and toughness defensively is what he makes a living off, as despite playing no more than 25.2 minutes per night over his four career seasons, he's averaged a steal per game in every year. To be clear, I could spend much more time breaking down these next few impact players, but they deserve mentions. Having said that, it's good to see Malik Beasley in a good state of mind, as the 25-year-old Florida State product is a streaky, yet at times super effective, pure shot creator. Beasley isn't known for his defense, but seems to always have solid positioning and activity on that end. Malik's just another young, athletic, and active two-way talent who's shooting around 40% from three-point range for Utah. Like Jordan Clarkson, former Detroit Piston Kelly Olenek is extremely underrated, as Olenek's currently the second most efficient three-point shooter in the NBA, only behind Dallas's Josh Green. Kelly's making 58.8% of his shots from deep on a decent volume of 2.8 triples attempted per night. Like this team's number one guy in Markinen, Olenek's thrived in this floor spacing based era. Speaking of overlooked players, I've gone this entire video without mentioning the least respected member of the Utah Jazz of them all, Jared Vanderbilt. While I just said that stretch bigs are a hot commodity, combo forwards who are versatile enough to defend one through five have a similar impact nowadays. Jared's lateral movement plus constantly engaged and pesky on-ball clamps are a reason for Utah ranking number eight in the association in team defense. Vanderbilt's had to miss a few games due to injury and he doesn't qualify to rank among the top power forwards but owns what would be the third best defensive rating at his position only behind Milwaukee's Giannis and Portis. Vanderbilt's presence alone helps smooth out the team's amount of wily veterans with youthfulness, but whether it's the 7'1", 245 pounder up front out of Auburn, Shea's cousin in Nikhil Alexander-Walker, or this year's 14th overall draft selection in OK Abaje, there's plenty of hungry, yet NBA-ready youngins for the Jazz coaching staff to work with, and most importantly, develop. The Jazz are now set up tremendously well for both the present and the future, making them this year's Cinderella team in the early going. Who's most underrated on the Utah Jazz? 
Best answer down below in the comments gets next video shout out. And the top five commenters by December 21st earn free merchandise of their choosing. Today's Speaks winner is Jerron, who says the most underrated part about Luka is that he can't be stopped by different defensive schemes or zones because he's able to score or create an open shot for his teammate every time, and that makes him unguardable. Great take there from Jaron. Anyways, thanks for watching.